Welcome to the Defense and Aerospace Report. I'm Vago Maradian here in Arlington, Virginia. We recently conducted a wide-ranging exit interview with Air Force Lieutenant General Chris Bogdan, the outgoing program executive officer of the F-35 Lightning II program. I asked him to explain what he thought were the good decisions that were made on the F-35 program and what decisions he thought he would do over. You have spoken, uh, given your tenure and your experience on the program, about the problems of F-35. You answered the question more broadly earlier about uh, acquisition lessons learned in your career. On the F-35, is there anything new you want to say or different? You know, you've been thinking about this question about what was done right on F-35 and what was done wrong on F-35 that has uh, kept you working 24 hours a day, 365 days uh, for for the last five years on this program, uh, which which I'm sure your family is also going to be glad to get to see a little bit more of you uh, now. But you know, what do you have a, a revised view of what you think was gotten right on this program, and what, for God's sakes, are the warning bells to never again repeat on any other program? Yeah, especially as we as both the Air Force and the Navy, again, talk about a sixth-generation airplane and, and a focus on that, and there are some folks saying, hey, let's come together. There are some folks who say, oh, hell no, you know, we shouldn't get any, any closer. You know, what's, what's, what's your sense on that? Yeah, there's, there, there's some pretty good lessons learned that coming out of the F-35 program in my five years here. Um, first and foremost, as I said before, uh, I think we were way overly optimistic early on in this program to think that we could put that many new technologies into a weapon system and do it on the timelines for the money we had. The notion of fifth generation LO, fusion of sensors, a helmet that without a HUD, um, those are fairly leading edge technologies. And, and I think we under, clearly underestimated how hard that was going to be uh, in overall integration to make it all work. Um, so again, back to, the, um, back to being over, overly optimistic. Um, second, this program started under a different concept than where we are today, and that concept was called TISPR, T-S-P-R, which stood for Total System Performance Responsibility. And what that meant was that back in the day, back in the early, the late 90s and early 2000s, um, uh, we kind of convinced ourselves that part of the problem with major acquisition programs was we had too many specs and too many overarching oversight things that the government was doing. And it would be better to give most or all of that responsibility to industry and kind of get out of their way. And that's how this program started. I can tell you I am not a strong proponent of that. Okay, Industry and government sometimes overlap in what they need to do, but they don't always overlap. And the, and the government needs a more assertive role um, in running big programs like this in terms of the requirements, in terms of executing the dollars, in terms of what we need to do. This program did not start out that way, and, and it, it, it proved to be costly for us. Um, thirdly, um, I think the notion of concurrency on this program was taken to the extreme. Um, we started the production line long before we even flew our first test sortie. Every program has to have some level of concurrency um, because you couldn't run a program serially, you know, and, and get it done in a reasonable amount of time. So there has to be an overlap of the different phases. And the classic overlap is between the development and the testing with the production. On this program, we enjoyed a level of concurrency that I had never seen before. Um, and it was not, and, and it cost us. And, and how did it cost us? It cost us because I have 210 airplanes in the field today, and I've got another 80 or 90 coming off the production line, and none of them are in the final full configuration of the airplane because over the years we found out so many things we had to change that we, we, had, to, we had to redesign portions of it. But by the time that got into the production line, those airplanes were long gone. So I'm going to have, we're going to have nearly 300 airplanes out there that over the next few years are going to have to come back and get modded to be a full, you know, capable F-35. That, that's a very, very difficult thing to do. So I think from a concurrency perspective, um, uh, we probably could have done a better job there. Last one is running joint programs. Okay, this is, this is a joint program like no, no other. We have eight partners, three FMS customers, and three services. Um, I think there is a place for joint programs in DOD, but I don't think there's a place for a program that thinks that they can build one platform with three variants that can serve three very, very different users with very, very different requirements. Um, and we're learning that. 
Um, the airplane was supposed to start off about 70% common. Today, it's probably about 20 or 25% common from a hardware perspective. That's because building an airplane that lands on an aircraft carrier at 130 knots is very, very different than building an airplane that needs to vertically take off and land. Um, but we tried to do that all in one. So my suggestion to DOD would be don't give up on joint programs, but let's look at those technologies that can truly be joint and, and, and develop those jointly and then build them into portions of other programs. So on the F-35, for example, most of the system, mission system software and the vehicle system software is common across all the variants. You could develop that jointly. The weapons we're putting on the airplanes, you could develop that jointly. The helmet, the same. You could develop that jointly. But when it comes to maybe the airframe and the flying characteristics and what it needs to do, maybe you don't, maybe you don't start off joint. Maybe you start off with three program offices that then tap into the jointness of those other things, like an engine, A model and C model engine, exactly the same. And you use the jointness where it's best used and keep the uniqueness where it needs to be. I think everybody will find that that'll be a little more um, friendly for, for, for everybody. And, and you'll still save some money. You'll still save some money and, and you'll still be efficient, but everybody will kind of um, get what they want instead of having to compromise so from, much. From an obsolescence standpoint, um, what's the best way to handle that? This is a program that's been under development for 20 years. You said there are going to be 300 jets that are going to have to come home and get fixed. You're already dealing with an obsolescence problem on parts that were coming in in 05, 04, 06 that are now outmoded. How do you, how do you address that? Do you have to go more to form, fit, and function uh, specification? Now, how do you handle that? Because it's been a challenge. I mean, on the F-22 program, I think we went to two or three cycles on that by the time the aircraft was even fully fielded. How do you address that challenge? So one of the things you need to do up front is you need to take a look at the systems and the components that you're trying to develop and, and try and look ahead and say, these are the components, the technologies that we know over time are going to change. Um, computers and software, you know, the software we run on computers, you know, th that's gonna change from now until, you know, forever. So you ought to be prepared when you start the program to understand that you need to insert technology at appropriate points and plan for it and plan for it. Not only to take care of the diminishing manufacturing sources, but to take advantage of the future technologies that have yet to be built. But if you plan for those, even though you don't know, maybe know specifically what that technology is, you have a better chance of running a long production program that doesn't end up obsolete at the end. I, I can tell you things like computers uh, on the airplane, sensors, certain sensors like e electro-optical electro sensors, uh, even in some instances radars. You know those are going to continue to evolve time and time again. So you ought to build your program with specific technology insertion points uh, to, to keep pace. The better answer really is to do things in increments. So when you get to your next increment, you're ready for the new technology. But if you can't do that, then, then you've got a plan for that. And that requires a, a good partnership between industry and the department to be able to look into the future and understand what's coming down the road and how it can apply to your weapon system and build that in build that technology insertion and that DMS program from the beginning. We didn't do very much of that early on in the F-35 program, and we're finding now to keep the weapon system viable in the future, we've got to do a lot more of it. There are those who say that the department is airing too much for uh, lowest cost, uh, for that they're putting um, unit cost ahead of the efficacy of the platform. There are some who look, for example, at the B-21 program and say, that there's not enough margin that's been built into the airplane that was finally selected uh, and, and that that's going to cause downstream challenges. What's the right approach? What's the right balance point? Because ultimately these systems are going into service not just because they're the lowest cost to operate per hour or the lowest cost to acquire, but are the ones that are delivering the greatest capability. Um, yeah, there's a balance there and that, that, that's a, a tough balance to figure out. I would tell you there are some instances where um, the technologies are so similar and, and provide a level of advantage for us, no matter which vendor you go to or, or how you implement that technology, that the low price might be the right way to go. Um, the important thing there is, and, and, and I, I'm going to 
I'm going to talk about the B-21, although I do not know a lot about it. I think the B-21 guys, they came and talked to the F-35 and me and our program a lot before they put the requirements in place. They talked to other 5th Gen, F-22. They talked to B-2. Um, I think they got it just about right when it came to what can we develop in the near term and make sure that we don't run into any dead-end streets in the future. So what you're seeing maybe in the B-21 is what we talked about. That first increment of the B-21 is not the be-all or end-all, and you're already hearing people criticize that. I think probably from their perspective, they're looking more long-term for those incremental upgrades and ensuring that the growth can be there. Um, people just don't like what they see up front because it's not that shiny thing at the end that they thought it was going to be. So. Um, there is a role. There is a role for um, low cost, technically acceptable. Um, but if you want to maintain a combat advantage over your enemies, and you never want to go into any fight fair, you always want to be better. There's some element of risk to that, and that risk probably costs you some money. So you might not always be able to go to the lowest cost guy. Uh, well, look, it's worth pointing out that the F-16 was a light day fighter, and it has evolved to a multi-mission, all weather, day night. Uh, strike, recce, everything else. So it's it's Great it's answer. it's it's mer it's evolved into that program.